How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. We, we were just talking and uh, set record because you were talking about your headphones and sound quality. So you've upgraded your headphones. What were you saying? They're not very good. Well, it's the only bit of podcasting or video kit I've upgraded in like two years. Um, I know that you've got all the gear, but for me... <laughs> And no idea. Yeah. <laughs> For me, I've always relied on my white iPhones headphones, like the ones you actually plug in. I'm such a millennial. No, not even pods, not even AirPods, right? Because they're just annoying. They disconnect, reconnect all the time, run out of battery, right? So I just like the really old school. But I managed to like burn my iPhone headphones on the hob when I was listening to a podcast and cooking. And then I looked down and like, okay, anyway, we don't need to hear about how. This is the content people, no, this is what people come for. We run businesses that are successful and we have free time. And guess <laughs> what? We, we do dumb things. <laughs> yeah, I, I burn cables on the hub. Anyway, so these, these beauties are um, a Christmas present for my husband and they're like wireless noise cancelling headphones everything so I look like I have a podcast now which is great but I look the part yeah I look the part I look the part you've got all the things now though haven't you you've got like an arm for your microphone well well I have these things so this is what I think is funny this microphone so for listeners out there wondering why the sound quality is so fantastic which I know it's not this is a blue yeti mic that I bought in 2012 2013 I know we're matching it was meant to be Vicky 2012 I bought this microphone like because at the time I was becoming like getting obsessed with the Tim Ferriss podcast I'm going to launch a podcast this is what it's all about and it sat in a box for well until the beginning of COVID pretty much (laughs) and never it never touched it and now we've been using it for the podcast and I keep thinking you were saying you're you're listening to like podcasts that are all about audio quality and I've been thinking like we we got obsessed about we were going to launch on YouTube and it was going to be massive and and, like that that's where we were thinking and I tried to do something to make my backdrop if you're watching on YouTube you can see my backdrop has some stuff in there but we know most of the audience is just listening to this on audio. And so I too have been thinking like, well, we both listen back to the podcast. Vicky does a better job than I do. Like Vicky takes responsibility for making sure that I don't get swear words out and stuff too much. You're not too Northern. <laughs> not too Northern, <laughs> which I'm definitely not, am I? I listen to back to it whilst I'm, I'm driving from place to place to assess the quality and listen to what's going well and what could be improved. Like, you know, what? put time and effort in and one of the things I noticed was oh my goodness like my audio sounds tinny and I want to improve that I'm interested I guess is what I'm saying on what we can do to improve and you're right I've bought a load of gear and it's not coming out until I move offices so I'm doing an office move I'm going to upgrade the set I'm going to put some time effort and money into at least looking like I might know what I'm talking about (laughs) And then you can tell me I've got it all wrong. <laughs> in YouTube right now, I've noticed when I've watched it back that like my, my face has been quite like blanked out by the light that I've got in here. So I've invested quite a lot of money in a very expensive bit of kit to help diffuse the light. And that is the, the back of a, a bill. Um, that I've just literally... <laughs> I don't okay. want the bill looking at me anymore, so I've put it in front of, and now the light's diffused, you see. so A professional. You can buy the kit, but you can DIY it pretty much as well. So that's quite exciting, the start of the year, new kit. We've got some really big plans for this podcast as well. We're going to make a million quid this year. We're going to make a million quid, love talking about that. And I think everyone loved that episode, actually. It went down quite well with a lot of people yeah yeah and we're committed to being here for the rest of the year so I'm quite excited about that how has the start of your year gone so far in business I mean when we're recording this it's a week in so how's 2023 looking in terms of smashing that million quid yeah good actually um I've got all my sales targets nailed I am committing to two things this this podcast is gonna get up there and and bring in a million pounds for the podcast but i'm going all in on the content play so if anyone is following me on twitter at jack underscore sam uh, or on linkedin or anywhere actually i've started a new writing habit and i actually wanted to just share this like the reality of it i, I tried this at the end of last year i was like i'm going to get 
I'm going to build a 50,000 person following on Twitter. Like, how hard could it be? I know systems, like, just figure out the system that works and smash it. The thing that makes that hard is reality. <laughs> Being a human being, like, you don't have just endless energy, or I don't. Like, maybe, maybe some psychopaths out there, like, could do this. I can't. I guess I'm pleased I can't. Like, I, I think I'm normal. But, you know, energy waxes and wanes, family happens, like, you have a late night for, you know, because the cat was sick or whatever, like whatever, whatever reality gets in the way. And the truth is, like, there's a difference between being interested in something and being committed to something. What I sort of well, I had, took a cold, hard look at myself and went, you know, I haven't really committed to this. Because if I was committed to it, there would be time blocks in the diary that I would protect at all times. So the I, I took a leaf out of your book from last year and, and a few other people's. And I've done a lot of reading and I found my golden hour. A golden hour has two criteria. The first criteria is your time is not being demanded by anybody else. So that means no phone calls, no family, no dishwasher to do, no, no, no meetings, no client calls, no other tasks on the horizon. So that's that's the criteria number one is you don't have any outside distractions. Criteria number two you are focused, you have energy. This is a peak moment for you. Now, having a son, I don't have much time or energy or peak moments these days. <laughs> I struggle. I know you, you were like having kids. So when is the least worst <laughs> time to have? And uh, I've been getting up consistently early. Oh, welcome to the club. Six o'clock in the morning, so not ridiculously early. And you, you mentioned this last year. Yeah, yeah. And I've been writing every day and a couple of tools that have worked really well. Typeshare, not a big fan of the scheduling on Typeshare, I've got to be honest, or the editing. Hype Fury, I, pr I prefer for the editing, but I'm sticking with Typeshare, giving it its due. What is Typeshare? What is it? Typeshare, it's a, it's a writing platform. So two guys whose names I'm blanking on, Ship30 guys, uh, the founder Ship30, which is like a write 30 pieces of content in 30 days to, to course. They create this piece of software. And what's good about it is it has these content template packs in. Now, I'm not suggesting that you, you want to templatize all of your writing, but one of the biggest challenges is like just coming up with ideas for your content and what resonates, and you want to test all these ideas. So anyway, Typeshare, been really good for that, and it's nice. It kind of it publishes on Twitter, it publishes to Medium, it publishes to LinkedIn. It doesn't do the Instagram like Hype Fury does, which I think could be a nice little touch. So it doesn't do 100% of everything, and it's still a bit janky in places, but, but those content templates are great, like being completely open and honest. Done Justin Welsh's uh, Content OS. I bought you know, Matt Gray's content system. Like the, the guys that we follow, we go, oh, these guys are, you know, they're doing the efficient business content production, making millions of pounds from selling one simple course and helping a lot of people. I mean, I think that's something uh, that's future. So, yeah, in short, six days in, it's January 6th. <laughs> I've, I've been consistent for six days, combined in a couple of other healthy habits. Uh, so, good is the short answer, I think, for business. And some interesting results, which we'll share. How was how it going for you anyway? Sorry, that was a, a bit of a monologue. No, no I, I liked it. And I'm, I'm really interested that you've talked about Golden Hour because that leads me nicely to in a little bit to the topic I want to bring to the pod today, actually. But my year started off pretty pretty good. I didn't really take a break over Christmas. I took like four, three, Germania. four. Yeah, yeah. I, I took kind of like three, four days off over the Christmas weekend, which was lovely. Switched off, stayed with family, got fed and watered. Kids were looked after. It was brilliant. Yeah, like really, really good. But I sort of just kept slightly plugged in throughout the period because, you know, that's kind of what you do when you run an ads agency and you've got live ads running, basically. It was nice not to have constant email meetings. That was like the glorious part. And so as I've come back this week, officially <laughs> with the rest of the team as well, I'm really mindful to remove ruthlessly any meetings and superfluous tasks and things like that 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 I don't need and I have done a few late nights this week because we've just had quite a lot to do but I take off two hours every afternoon to go do the school pickup right so I don't feel as burnt out as I did maybe a little bit before Christmas when we were just trying to do the slog so I want to kind of keep that going and it feels very alien to me to say no to a quick call or things like that so but keeping my diary as free as possible is like a, 
it's kind of like a big thing for January, definitely. And I must say, I've managed to get out quite a lot of content in the past couple of weeks. I've seen a lot of reels. Yeah, loads. Of, well, the, the, I've been able to get my real game running again and my, my sort of short form video game running again because I've had this pressure taken off me with the written content. Like most of my written content is started with chat GPT at the moment. And then I rewrite it and put it back out as a little test over Christmas. It was Christmas day. We were all down the pub in London. I was like, I haven't posted. I want to post something, but I'm tired. I want to pay attention to the kids and stuff. So I opened up chat GPT on my phone. I said, could you write a Merry Christmas message to my followers and tell a funny joke. And it did. It, it, it did it in a funny way. It was just like, it was a funny joke about being watched on your webcam by Santa and his elves or whatever. And uh, it, it took off. People loved it. And I just sat there, look, showed it to my husband. I was like, look, they don't know that that was written by AI, <laughs> basically. And then I just got to carry on, put my feet up, hang out, just chat with people, which is lovely. That kind of ideas sparking, filling in the gaps. Like I had to go live this morning in my group and I was talking about a topic, but I hadn't written the pretext for the video. I was like, oh, it's quick. So chat GPT helped me write that in like literally a minute. Had to write a Facebook ad headline during the session. So I was like, come on guys, let's open up the tour and do that. So I feel like there's a mental load that's been lifted over this period by just being able to go, hey, chat GPT, uh, how can I write this? What's a good thing to do with this? Da, 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 da. Right. That's definitely something I want to carry on and, and kind of continue in January. I want to ask you a couple of questions about your process, but I, I also feel triggered and want to like make a statement to defend the use of AI and chat GPT even. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you because there's been a bit of backlash recently, right? Yeah, people slagging it off and I'm like, uh, okay, so academically, we know there's like this adoption curve and if people aren't aware of the adoption curve, there's a great book called Crossing the Chasm by one of the guys we like, by Jeffrey A. Moore. Nice little diagram. If anyone's on YouTube, I'm holding up the front cover here because there's a nice diagram of an even distribution curve. That is a great book cover. Yeah, if you're not on YouTube, you should come find us. You should come find yeah, us, yeah. Uh, Chief Optimization <laughs> Officers. And basically, he very academically you know, identifies that disruptors make up about 2.5% of the market. The adopters make up about 12.5% of the market, I think. And then late stage early adopters make up about 32, 34% of the market. And then laggards, which are people that are still on Android and haven't bought an iPhone yet. <laughs> they make up 2% of the market. And then you've got tail, like late, very late stage people that don't like technology. Anyway, there's a load of people, I think, that are kind of they're in the pot works, doesn't it? So you don't know how much of this is genuine sentiment, like don't like AI. I think there's a lot of fear, like people are fearful. But let's, let me just say this, right? We don't now criticize the local butty shop for buying in their bread. Like, it just doesn't make sense that they would bake their own bread in the butty shop to make your butty. It's like, it's more efficient they buy it in. You don't expect them to have chickens out the back and then butcher them and fill up them. And they buy in ready-made chicken. If you make cars, you don't build your own smelting, you know, iron smelting or, what you know, aluminium electrolysis kit. You don't ship in carbon so that you become experts in that. You leave that to the experts and you use these tools to make a superior end product. And for me, chat GPT, the use of AI tools, the use of home automation, for instance, the use of electricity, like these are just tools that better enable us to be our best creative self. Sure, like it's not all sunshine and roses and there are some drawbacks and whatever else, but on the whole, like this makes us better as humanity, you know, in the same way that having heating in our homes does and the way that penicillin works, like it's not voodoo or black magic, like it's science. And it helps. What the hell's going on? Is it ignorance? Naive? Like, what's, I don't know. I think just looking like literally in like in the Google news feed like this morning, right? Literally like every story, that's just not showing up very well there, so I won't show. Yeah, but like every story has been chat GPT banned from AI conference. You can't write scientific papers of it. New York public schools block chat GPT. Princeton student builds chat GTP detection app. Like, you know, there's a lot of discussion about plagiarism and the fear of students using chat GPT to write papers. And that for me is baffling, right? Because 
that is like the Streisand. Like fan calculators, Ross Verrado. It's the Streisand effect, right? The more you talk about it, the more people are going to go and find it and look at it and focus on it, right? So what I think the school system, the academic sphere and you know other kind of businesses and sectors that are worried about chat gpt should be doing is evolving right so you can't test a student anymore on their knowledge by getting them to write a paper so you get them in and you record them on video talking verbatim about a particular topic or, or subject instead right you can't test them for their their kind of like their memory in an exam process you know or so test critical thinking yeah you could test them in a kind of an exam um environment instead like rather than getting them to go away and do research and find stuff i'm concerned that the first reaction is the knee jerk ban reaction here as well and i've also seen a lot from a kind of the business world i've also seen a lot of content about the livelihood of copywriters being threatened that again for me is like why aren't copywriters evolving why aren't they becoming like ideation or ideas people? You know, if they're worried about like not being paid to like write words, why are they not remarketing themselves to kind of be creative, strategic thinkers who can use tools like Chat GPT to help with their own work on behalf of clients? You know, what an AI tool like this isn't doing is replacing great creative thinking and serendipitous creativity. I think it enhances it instead. And in the case of like my world, my small business community, like these guys are so low on time, like time is what they don't have. And they've been told by all the gurus, etc., to be writing Facebook posts, writing Instagram posts, creating posts in Canva, posting every single day. Like, Which does work, but it takes a hell of a lot of time. Yeah, but they're so exhausted, yeah, with that as a strategy for raising awareness for their businesses that a lot of them just don't do it. They become sort of paralysed with overwhelm, you know, and the content burnout is definitely a thing and I think that makes creativity suffer that does right <laughs> and so they do what you were talking about earlier is that they invest in content packs and templates and, and things like that as well yeah which is not not as creative <laughs> no but but chat gpt for me is no different from you buying a content pack from someone you know you would go in and rewrite it slightly and put your tone of voice in and things like that but you know it has the potential of expediating you getting info about your business out there right yeah yeah there's a product 100 queries for chat gtp write your content for 2020 you know like that that would work i'll buy the domain afterwards <laughs> yeah yeah should do, yeah you should do i i bought an ai domain actually uh, which maybe we'll talk about another time my introduction to ai to this model which actually uh using a, a product called jasper was by my friend al and shout, uh, let's give a shout out rebel copy club and al's a super sensible guy he's worked in education and other things and has been short on time to do a lot of work very quickly like we all have when he came into the copywriting world, he looked into all these tools and he introduced me to a whole host of tools that use and leverage AI. But let's be really clear, to rank on Google, to, to get people seeing your content, your content's got to be good quality. No one cares how it was made. Yeah, okay, people are talking about penalizing if it was made via AI. Very difficult to say it was. Ultimately, it's the experience. I mean, like people don't get upset when they go watch a Disney film that, you know, a lot of, you don't get upset about CGI that's done with AI. When you're watching the football or the tennis and the fact that AI has put together that clip reel for you, you don't care because it's a great experience. You don't care that the fact that your alarm's not going off at night because your cameras have picked something up and they can detect it's a cat rather than a burglar. Like, you don't care that AI did that. You just care that it works. And so it seems bonkers to me that, we would get upset about it. Have you seen Zapier have now built an integration for ChatGPT? Oh my God, like literally just found out this second from you. Okay, well, I'm going to go and look at that and report back on that then because I'm really interested on that. So, so for anyone that doesn't know, like ChatGPT is no code. Zapier is no code. So that means you don't have to understand software and you can set automations going. So one of the use cases I saw was that they basically like set up a Notion form. It doesn't matter what if you use Notion or not, they set up a form which you can access, again, no code, where you just put in your content idea. Like, for instance, we might say, you know, a piece of content about saving time whilst working in your small business. And then that triggers 
a query to chat GPT to say, hey, can you write me three content options about saving time in your small business? And chat GPT will go off and do that. So suddenly, like, you as a as a business owner can be like, well, I'm a specialist in cedar wood, and you know it's a million uses, and you can you can say, well, I've these ideas, but you know they're not really well formed, and I'm not really a copywriter or a content writer. And GPT can get you there, and you can suddenly educate, like it's massive. That is the that is the key. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like if it can bring you forward to the point where you become a sub editor right? You rewrite content that's been given to you already. That just saves so much time. It, it really does. However, I, I must say, I joined Daniel Priestley, author of Oversubscribed. And, oh, yeah. Key person of influence. Yeah. Key person of influence chap. Yeah. Big deal. Nice guy. Yeah. He did a webinar over the Christmas period talking about AI for small businesses or AI for business and entrepreneurs specifically. So, of course, I signed and joined. And I joined so I could see... I was hoping it would be an open Zoom and it was so you could see what people were talking about in the chat. And that that's what I was there for, because I've seen him do a demo before. I think he's really good at using his thesis on why businesses should adopt it is great. Right. But he's a great public speaker, isn't he? Really engaging. He's really good. He's great at conveying ideas. You know, so it's about 200 people on this webinar Zoom. I was just in the comments, just looking at the comments, seeing how people were talking. And what was really interesting is like half were like, mind blown right they were like oh my god and you could see some of them had stopped what they were doing gone away come back because they were like oh my god I just got chat GPT to write me 10 blog posts five posts da, 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 right really exciting really happy for those guys right because they were asking really meaningful questions about how they could use it to improve the speed and delivery of the marketing sales in the business right which is you know, if you're an entrepreneur, solopreneur on your own, that can't be a bad thing because you're constantly worrying about your time. If you don't have the money to outsource, there's only so much you can do. So your business is constantly making a set of compromises, right? So really happy for them. The other half, however, right, these weren't happy bunnies. These were resistors are laggards right a couple of people clearly were in the copywriting space and they had to keep repeating in the comments oh well you can't just write a blog post with this because google will detect it i was like no it can't (laughs) well there are plagiarism checkers anyway yeah exactly they will say you know what percentage of this is like other stuff that exists you could do that writing copy manually like yeah, yeah. Well, this is this is it, right? Because it's just a, a matter of statistics. You, you could, you know, a thousand monkeys all typing the same thing. Da da da. You, you could end up writing the same post that's out there. There's so many blog posts that, that are published like every single week, you know, on the internet. And what Google's looking for mostly is direct duplication. It doesn't like that. So I, I kind of saw that comment and thought that sounds like fear there. And then someone else asked a question about. Well, if I put in information about my business and got it to output like a, you know, a legal letter, does it store my business information? And what does it do with it? And does it give it to other people? And there wasn't that understanding about the the sort of the rubber duck way that AI works. It's dumb. It takes content from you about something and it outputs it meaningfully but it, it doesn't go away and go oh Sam Jackson's business or Vicky Jake's and, uh, well it did it. like uh, so there was a real concern yeah, I'm going to use this information to blackmail them now <laughs> yeah yeah take over their bank account it's not there where are the servers base yeah you know there's a real like like concern about Skynet taking over lack of understanding genuine understanding I think we should spend some time and effort over the next 12 months trying to help educate and help others understand as we become you know we're not experts we're, but we I think we have the technical where for all to explain this to people hopefully totally and I, you know that's definitely going to be something in this podcast we'll, we'll just keep coming back to again and again in 2023 right because for us optimizing a business definitely is about looking at the things you're doing, the time you're spending, the tools that you're using, the decisions that you're making. If AI can help any any part of that process, that that's just like, aside from it being perfect content for us, <laughs> that just makes what we're talking about and how to help businesses so much easier 
as well, especially if you've got to be like jack of all trades in your business or a jackie of all trades. And, you, you know, you need to be a bit of an accountant, a bit of a copywriter, a bit of a salesperson, a bit of a marketer to rely on AI to help you think in those areas. I mean, that game changer. When we started this, we didn't know AI would kick off the way it did. So I, I feel like lots of things have come together. We found our thing, definitely. I think I've got a deep techie background. You've got a deep marketing background and software you know, background. I, I feel like we found our, our niche here is in optimize your time, optimize yourself with AI. Actually, a good story, which I think would be a segue is into what we, we want to get into today. I've mentioned before, I'm in this WhatsApp group of business owners, and these are businesses that are, you know, 50 at the low end to, to well over a million uh, pounds turnover. All UK businesses doing a whole variety of things, building uh, important materials and whatever else. And one of the guys in there has a remote team, virtual team, and one of his team he delegates customer service to, and he had this customer service issue where he had an awkward client who was causing him some problems and he, he needed to resolve the issue. And typically what he would do is delegate this to the customer service guy. It bubbled up to his level because like, it's a, a financial problem for the business, so he needs to resolve it. And typically, he'd write some instructions. Hey, you know, we've, we've got this client. Some of the stuff they've bought is damaged. They've spent this much money with us. We need to fix the kit that's there and then you know, maybe do something else. And, and usually, he'd send this brief to, to the customer support agent. Instead, what he did is he went into chat GPT yeah, and said, hey, this is the background. This is the situation. And by the way, this client has been a bit of an ass, like, and they're annoying me, <laughs> and and I don't feel great, and put these emotions in. And we've said about this before, like, AI isn't sentient because it doesn't have emotions, but he put in his emotions to this thing. Chat GPT came back and said, awfully sorry for the problems you had, gave him this, gave him this email response, right? And I'd love to share a copy of it, maybe I should ask him for it, but... The summary is, he said, awfully sorry for the experience you've had. If you've got any issues with the equipment, please return it. We'll give you a full refund. However, we'd like to keep it and offer you a discount, some money back. And then what it also did, which he didn't ask it to, is said, and if you'd like to place another order, we'd like to offer you 25% discount on any future orders. He didn't even ask it to do this, right? And the, the guy that was a problem didn't take the refund and just bought some more stuff instead with 25% off. And now this friend of mine who runs this business is coming to me going, can we write some standard operating procedures for my support people to use chat open AI tool <laughs> to improve it? And he's now saving hours and hours every day. And I know this is what we want to talk about because uh, should we tell everyone like this is going to be our first sponsored podcast and what we want to talk about sponsorship wise because yeah definitely like I said at the kind of start of the episode I'm really all about getting rid of superfluous tasks and really focusing my time on kind of deep work so it's really interesting that you spoke about the golden hour and one of the the tools that I adopted a couple of years ago I still use two years later like I just found it by accident on the internet after using a lot of productivity tools for a while you know I rave about this tool to my community, to my list, to lots of people. and to me. <laughs> now to you. <laughs> and I raved about them so much, they made me an ambassador as well. It's a tool called Sunsama. Sunsama. How's that spelled? Uh, S-U-N-S-A-M-A. Okay, yeah, gone. gone. The Daily Planner for Busy Professionals. Right. So we've, we've all been there, like, with trying to plan our days, right? And there's loads of methodologies and thought processes for kind of how to do that effectively. But for me, I think what makes it so awesome is it's anti-online planner sensibilities, right? And I'll explain myself first, right? Oh, what do you mean by that? Yeah, cool. Break that down. So around lockdown time, I, I think I've spoke about this previously before, around lockdown time, went from being on my own, working at home, to having kids, husbands, sick cats, all in the house with me all at once. And I found that getting up at like 5 a.m. and kind of doing my work really early was a better way of being able to kind of get written content and things like that done. And um, it was from an old mentor of mine, Janet Murray, who'd recommended this. So she'd gone through a process of trying to find different ways to sit down and work. Turns out she went off and got an ADHD diagnosis and got that. So she, you know, she was grappling with like that in her personal life. But her grappling was beneficial for the community that that we were in with her. She went off and did this thing called Focusmate, which is like a, a website that you can join and you get connected with someone randomly 
both put your cameras on, your mics on, and then you sit and work in like, I think it's 35 minute burst. It, it might be a little bit longer, maybe 40 minutes or something. And the idea is that by having someone sat there doing the work with you, you actually do it. That for me, when she was talking about it, was like it brought a light on for me because it's like, oh, I find like, I can sit at my desk all day and not do a lot. Oh, I'll just check my socials. Ding, ding, ding. I work in social media. Oh, I better go and see what, what the trending topic is on Twitter. And there you go. It's like an, an hour gone, right? So like she'd gone and done that work and done Focus Mate. And I, I went and did it a couple of times, very random, by the way. That like, was often working with like, you know, students from China you know, <laughs> no one's spoken. Either. Those guys were. Yeah, it was just like, you just saying that. Like you see them in the U- UK universities, they work hard. And you just say in the chat what, what you're going to work on. Janet went and created her own co-working sessions anyway. And Is this Janet, Janet Murray? Janet Murray, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Janet Murray. Yeah, yeah, she runs the Courageous Content podcast which is pretty good. And she brought people together. And so we would get up at 6 a.m. three times a week and all work together. And that accountability and focus time was really important. We'd have our mics off just in case so we weren't annoying each other. But there was no like going to the toilet. There was no like, oh, I just go. You had your camera on. So funny and around. Yeah. And then at the end, you all told each other what you got done. Like at the beginning, you're meant to sort of say in the chat what you're going to do. And then if you didn't get that thing done, there's definitely a feeling that would develop in me where I'd, I feel like I let myself down or I'd started to learn that I'd, I'd over promised to myself what I could get done in the 45 minute sessions. Isn't this fascinating? Because you, we see this all the time. Like you and I, I think it wouldn't be unreasonable to call ourselves productivity optimization experts. Like we both have qualifications and experience in, in this domain, partly why we're doing the podcast. And even though we know all of this, like even though we know the medicine to give ourselves when we have these symptoms, it's unlikely that we treat ourselves. And it's kind of like, when you get a bit sick, like, you know, a bit of a rash or a cold or whatever, you're not quick to go get yourself mended. But if it's a pet, if it's a dog or a cat or your child, like, you're on that. And when they say, you know, you need to get in this medicine and it must be, you know, 26 minutes apart and it's got to be out of a golden teaspoon and it must be 5.6 mil, you do it by the letter. You're like, well, I've got this accountability to that. I'm, I'm going to look after them. But when it's for yourself, like you, you just don't care for yourself the same that you care for other people. Eh? And, and isn't it crazy that just a tiny bit of accountability? A fratch. Yeah. Well, Gary V talks about this. Gary Vaynerchuk, he said he didn't lose weight and get buff until he hired, like actually put on the payroll, a trainer. And then if he didn't get up and give that guy work to do, he'd let him down, basically. So, you know, he was it was real like accountability. But it was pretty amazing going through that process. And it was great during lockdown. And it it really made me self-aware about how I work. And one of the big things that came out of it was... Really, if you want to get something proper done, you you genuinely need to switch off everything, right? You can't have tabs open and work in one tab and your phone, you know, still uh, vibrating when a text comes in or whatever, or, you know, the ability for people to contact you. because The technology will win. Like you've, you've got rings, dings, alerts. We are simple human beings designed to run around in the fields and, you know, live in nature. And we've built this technology which is optimized to get our attention. Like, is it any wonder we struggle to focus when we surround ourselves by this? It doesn't, uh, what's his name, Phil Graham with a makers versus managers schedule? He says something like this, like you, you've got managers whose job is to make decisions and go from one meeting to the other meeting to the other meeting like, and, and constantly be on the wheel versus makers who are like designed to do deep work. They don't want any distractions. I'm going to create something, I'm going to make something. And, and meetings seem like a distraction, to sit, which they are. And it's really interesting that we're all starting to become makers. Like we've all got this interface to the same bit of tech, more or less, keyboard, mouse, screen. And we're trying to optimize this system here of inputs and outputs and reduce the distractions. It already got us years ago. And I must say, right, I do have pretty much all notifications apart from text because my husband or my mum can get me that way, right, on my phone, all switched off. I have certain websites blocked on my browser. Like, I've got a whole bunch of, like, tools and tripwires in place, like, to help me. But honestly, my brain is 
like a Harry Houdini of work. Like <laughs> if I'm like, <laughs> if I'm like, right, sit down, you've got to write your weekly newsletter. I'm like, yeah. Like and that's why I've always since university done my work the night before, because unless someone's actually going to sack me, shout at me. <laughs> that's why this podcast, we got together and we did it immediately because I knew if we did it, it wouldn't get done. Right. I like I work really well with like that accountability, that that sort of pressure. It's a hack, isn't it? Because if, if you uh, tasks will uh, swelter to fill the time allowed, so if you leave everything to the last minute, it will only ever take a minute. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm exaggerating, but you, yeah, it's a, it's a psychological paradigm, isn't it? You need that motivation, and you can try and stimulate that with coffee or with guilt or with you know childhood trauma or whatever whatever it is that gets you through the day. But like, there's some there's probably some better, like more productive, longer lasting processes and techniques that maybe we we can tell people about so this is what i love about sansama right so as a tool what it does is it gets you to create a to-do list for the day and it pulls in all of the things that you need to do from like your email tool your calendar you can pull in trello cards notion pages stuff from Jira or like all sorts right so it's it's kind of like set up for most kind of integrations I think Asana you can pull Asana into it as well and you can put all of your things that you need to do for the day into one place right is this on the desktop or is it on your phone or is it both or where is it yeah you can get the app I, I use it on my desktop and when you log in every morning it'll ask you to plan your day it encourages you to give enough time to each task so you can estimate time against it now if you're like me where I'm like okay yeah I need to give myself some focus time but I've got like a a real long list of things to do what you actually see in front of you is this unrealistic workload that's not been prioritized and that for me right when I realized I needed focus time to do my best work after doing that work in kind of Janet Murray's group and on focus mate and everything and then realizing the reality was like given myself a hundred things to do in like a eight nine ten hour day and then coming to this tool where it was like no 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 we don't like you working more than seven hours a day we want you to finish at four o'clock every day, right? That That's like all of the, the prompts and everything that comes up. And when you put in all of these to-dos and you look at this long list and you realise you've set yourself up for a 12-hour day, it asks you to think about what you can remove. So rather than going into each day, dragging in items that you hadn't completed the day before, the day before, the day before, what it does is it asks you to really crunch that list down every day. Now, if you can't do that, again, clearly I'm gaming the system here and going, yeah, I can do 20 things in one day. I'll just, you know, I'll work a bit more clever or whatever. You can drag tasks over, but after three days, it will archive them. If you haven't got to it. What I, what I found was amazing was I forgot them. If, if I didn't get to them, they weren't important. So I would then like once a week go in my archive and go, oh, yeah, I wanted to do a new thing for the my Instagram feed or whatever or for the agency. But I didn't do it. Was it that important if I never did it? And it really started to get me thinking about what genuinely was a kind of priority. And you have to, at the end of every day, close down. So you tell it when you want to close down for the day. So I'd like to finish at four o'clock today, right? So it'll bing up and kind of come up and say, because you should have it open all day and work through each of your things one by one. And the reason you should do that is when you start working on something, it expands the whole screen of the desktop and focuses you. (laughs) So you can't click it and see other tasks and something's going on in the back of your mind. And then at the end of the day, it asks you to review your day. And that two minute bit of mindfulness at the end of the day makes you realize, did I overpromise myself? Did I think I could do things that I can't really do? And it reminded me of that time doing the co-working where I was overpromising, oh, I'll write three blog posts in 45 minutes and I couldn't. And actually I learned to be a bit kinder to myself about the work that I can complete in any day. And it led to me eventually to start hiring people and be okay with that because I knew I couldn't, once I'd optimized my time using Sun Summer, to really work on the things that were making me money, I still reached a threshold where I realised 
I can't grow unless I hire people, unless I bring people in. And so it led me to move into like that next phase of business now and like now I'm using it my goal is to not track time or kind of look at those things in the tool but actually to ensure that my day is as free as possible and I do one core focus thing every single day like you in your golden hour so that's often writing or editing or like strategic thinking and if I don't do those because it's a habit now I feel like I've let the business down like, massively. I want to throw some frameworks around this. So whenever I think of like a business, I think of these cycles of activities that happen for the customer. So like the customer, you may be sending up ads, you may be making creative for them, you might be sending them a candle in the post, you might be building them a fighter jet. Like there's a whole series of activities that need to happen. And I mean series literally, like these tasks happen one after the other over a length of time. And so what I think you're saying is, well, all of those tasks can live in tools that are good for planning projects at that big strategic level, because you're talking about tasks that happen over a longer period of time, like, you know, a candle making process, is it something that takes a period of time? So they can live in Notion, Trello, Jira, you know, whatever the appropriate tool is for managing the projects, like that's the project's priorities. But then as an individual, all you can do is do one thing at a time, that's fact there is a book called the one thing which is brilliant like this idea of multitasking is just a fallacy you can do one thing and so it sounds like Sun Sam is fantastic at helping you prioritize the one most effective thing that you can do right now because it's true this whole project's got to happen but you can only do one thing at a time so it sounds like it it really helps you you know what's his name Covey style you know sharpen the axe and and do the the thing that's most important but What's really fascinating about what you said is, is we talk a lot about optimization of time, whether that's automating a process, delegating it, as you said, you like you outsourced your team, deleting it, like just getting rid of it, goes into the archive folder because it wasn't important. Like whatever these prioritization techniques are, great. That's time optimization. But the thing I really like that you said was about the happiness optimization because that's like a force multiplier. I think people have, have probably heard of like, a home advantage before like this is scientific fact it's not theory we're seeing this with ukraine and russia at the moment like a home defending force has a 10x multiplier that means like for every one person that's defending their homeland they are 10 times more capable more effective against the opposition than any opposition soldier because they're invading and it's the same with happiness. Like Sean Acor has written about this extensively. There's a thing called the happiness advantage. Like feeling happier actually helps you to identify more opportunity, make better decisions and be more productive. And you said like it gives you this reflection time at the end. And that for me, like I've, I've got this journal, it's a high performance planner. And, and the reality is like, I've got to get this thing out and I've got to do a decision. But you're saying that's like part of the workflow, like, it's just part of daily business. Yeah, exactly that. And we do it in Scrum, right? We do it with Agile. We have the daily stand-up and we have the, the sprint review, right? That is just part of the process. Without it, you can't optimise that team and take on the next sprint effectively because you keep making the same mistakes again, right? So why can't you apply that to the work that you're doing on a daily basis personally? Why can't you have like your own mini day reviews where you see what worked and what didn't and genuinely take like learnings out of those and apply them to the next day? The biggest struggle for me was I always felt in previous workplaces that my worth was in how much work I got done and quantity was always lauded over quality right so that is so ingrained in me that's actually taken years to realize that's not true and actually doing one thing really well is better than doing a hundred things mediocre right very high leverage yeah yeah for sure and you know uh, being able to have reflection built into like a daily to-do list, super useful here. I, I mean, there's plenty of like optimization, time optimization and time hacks people on YouTube I love, right? And I love to follow and, and everything. And, you know, I think a common consensus among a lot of them is to like at least have a bullet list of things you're doing every day, but you can only put like three or four things on it. 
And my list in the past had 20, 30, because it's like, yeah, the more I get done, the, the better it is. But actually, no one was coming up to me saying, well done for getting all 30 things done. And the serotonin that's released when you cross off those three or four things is far more powerful than, than kind of chasing the sort of 20 to 30 list. I think if we were to give advice, which, you know, who the hell are we to give advice? I don't have to listen to it. But what we have both said works is you do have to identify the one thing the highest leverage thing. And that's not to say the other things aren't important, but they're not as important. They might be essential, but they might not be the most important thing. And I really like the desktop Chrome extension called Momentum, where you just identify the one thing for the day. I honestly don't use it though. Like I use my notepad. Yeah, I mean, I have to write it down because the act of writing it down for me solidifies it in, in my brain. I don't think if I put it into a Chrome browser extension, I'd know what my one... I need to see it. I need to see it pop up. What's very true is that a blank piece of paper, a diary, a notepad, whatever, is great for refining your thinking, for, for refining what's going on in your head. Like, there's something about that kinesthetic thing, and there's probably some science to it. But with regards to some Selma, like, all those essential things that, you know, maybe the one big thing as well, this is a great way of tracking them and making them happen. Uh, is it? How, how much is it? Does it cost to get started? No, it's a 14-day free trial. So this is where I'm going to do the pitch. All right, so you can do two weeks. Do a pitch then, right? Warning everyone, we're doing a sponsored, sponsored <laughs> pitch now, okay? Please go sign up. But... <laughs> Honestly, I can't recommend it enough. I, I would say after 14 days of trying it, if you committed to doing it every single day, you would see a benefit from adding your tasks, working through your tasks, even if you didn't complete them all, I think by the end of the 14 days, you would know, you would become more self-aware as to whether you're over-promising, spending extra time on tasks that you shouldn't be, or if you're not prioritizing tasks so that the one thing that's going to make your business money, do the thing that you need to do in your business to find out whether you're deprioritizing that or not. I think it's $20 a month. So it's peanuts essentially for being able to save hours and hours and hours of time. And I loved it so much <laughs> that I, I brought my team in on it and they love the ability to bring in all of their emails into a to-do list, all their calendar items into a to-do list and all the Trello cards because we were using Trello at the time. And we could see each other's kind of to-do lists if you like, in a kind of group view. So we could keep each other accountable as well. So it worked really well from a, a kind of team perspective. But there's going to be a link in the show notes below the YouTube video if you're watching on YouTube as well. Just go give it a try. It's free. You've got nothing to lose. And we'd love to hear your feedback on whether you think it's a good tool or not. I mean, the interface is beautiful and it's just so pleasurable to use. And they have a great onboarding email series as well. So, you know, if you don't get that love from me, you'll get it from them. Yeah, I mean, here's what I'm interested in. So what are the integrations that exist? They're all a calendar, they're all a to-do like a Todoist. So we've got Todoist, we've got uh, ClickUp, Trello, there's Asana, Notion. Right, here is an offer, an open offer to anyone that's listening. I don't use this tool yet. I'm going to try it. Because I wouldn't say no to a bit more time optimization for a whole host of reasons we'll talk about in the next three months or so. But maybe we can tie this in maybe we could tie this in as a little experiment. So if, any, if anyone wants to give this a go, I will give it a go with you. Maybe we'll put this in as like an hour Zoom call. We can have a go. I'll share notes. I'll share how I'm using it. I'm making this offer on, on behalf of myself. Maybe Vicky, you want to jump in. And yeah, let us know how you're getting on with it. And then I'm going to see if I can't get this thing to integrate with Zapier and chat with GPT. I can, I'm going to see if I can't get it to integrate. It, it doesn't integrate with Zapier directly, so maybe we'll have to figure that out. But what I'm guessing is that I bet there is a way to put some tasks in here and then automate them off the back of it, or at least automate parts of those tasks. So maybe we could, if anyone wants to jump in and they want to, they want to automate some content creation, let's say, let's see if we can't help you do that. And I will share exactly how we do that. But you've got to sign up. You've got to have a go at the free trial. So you'll have to do the 14-day free trial. And then I will do that with you on Zoom. And if you want to do that, comment on YouTube or on Apple Podcasts and say, yeah, I'm up for it. And follow me on uh, Twitter at Jacks underscore Sam or follow Vicky. Let us know. Just get in touch. DM us. We'll talk to you. The real people. Yeah, well, let's make that happen. I feel like we could build a lot of productivity around this. Sam, can I just finish talking to you about another 
a time focus thing that I love just to finish up really quickly. So I don't use Focus Mate anymore. I, Janet Murray, I've left Janet Murray as well a long time ago. I still need to sit and work with people to get my stuff done. And I sit with a YouTuber called Merv three times a week. Merv, how's it spelled? M-E-R-V? M-E-R-V, yeah, Merv, who is, I might get this wrong, but I think she's a data science graduate, master's, really super smart person at the University of Glasgow. Might have moved universities in the past few months, so I'm, I'm not sure. But she basically... Aberdeen, University of Aberdeen, according to YouTube. Aberdeen, so she's moved to Aberdeen now, brilliant. So she sets a camera up on her study area, her desk, which overlooks beautiful Glasgow, beautiful Aberdeen or whatever. And for two to three hours, sometimes longer, sometimes there's a six hour study session for 50 minutes and then there's a 10 minute break those videos will go live and then there's chat alongside from people all around the world and at any one time there could be like a thousand two thousand people all working alongside each other I don't really follow with the chat but I have it on in the background and it's noises like you know her doing you know and looking at uh, writing her notes and things like that so what, she, she's just going live on YouTube and you're just following along with She's it. not live. It, it's it's clearly been like recorded and edited because there's normally an ambient track, slight ambience over the top as well. But she'll put those out like... Oh, yeah, four hours. Study with me at, at the library. Four hours study yeah, with me, so... background noise, <laughs> rain sounds. Awesome. She must be crushing it if she's doing all the studying. <laughs> there are so many study with me YouTubers, actually. So she's got like 700, 800,000 subscribers, right? Oh, my God. Yeah. And some of those videos. Nearly a million subscribers. Jesus. Yeah. And some, some of these videos could have more than 10 million views, right? So she makes money as a student, poor student, uh, with all the affiliate links to her kit in the blurb underneath the YouTube video as well. Fascinating world, great business model. Like I can't help but think when I'm sat there studying or doing my thing while she studies, sorry. So how do you film this? Do you go away? Is that what you're doing in your spare time? Do When do you put it up to YouTube, you know? And it, I mean, clearly people ask the same questions because there's just a massive list of all of the equipment that she uses. And anyway, genius business. Holy crap. Like it, it's got a chance to be super optimized because if you're already doing your work and you're you're filming yourself whilst you study and then you make money from the views on youtube brilliant good for her big fan already like this person it's my favorite way to get work done so at least three times a week i've got those videos on so i'll make sure there's a link in the description as well because i can't rave about merv enough to people <laughs> that's my secret <laughs> Yeah. Oh, secret productivity hack. So let's summarize today then. So we are recommending you identify your, your golden hour, that hour where you can do the most important tasks. We are recommending Sunsama, affiliate link also in the description. Uh, go give the 14-day free trial a go. And if you want to see how I get it set up with Vicky's help and optimize it, maybe put some automations in there using AI, let us know in the comments below and we will invite you to a, a Zoom or a Google Meets Hangout and uh, walk you through exactly what we're doing. And if you need something just to take away that silence in the background, give you, uh, you know, a bit of focus sound, check out Merv, M-E-R-V-E, -E, on YouTube, uh, University of Glasgow students, a shout out to Merv, awesome channel. This looks fantastic. And finally, most importantly, thank you very much for listening to the whole episode. Please like, subscribe, rate us if it's on Apple Podcasts. Get an Audacity and, and do whatever you do on Audacity. Uh, I'm not sure how you like it on there. Uh, same on Spotify. And if you're on YouTube, please, please, please give us a like, subscribe to the channel. And the biggest help, the gold star that you could get is if you share this with your friends, whether in a WhatsApp group, on in Facebook, Instagram, wherever you hang out online. Please share it because that's how we can continue to do the podcast, it's how we can get it to grow, and ultimately try and give you more value, but only if we can get the support of the audience. So your feedback is welcomed and appreciated. I feel like at some point, we should just throw money at the listeners, really, and do some type of competition as well. So, <laughs> so if you want cold, hard cash in the future, guys, subscribe. <laughs>
<laughs> and we'll, <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll reveal more once we've sorted the details. Well, Vicky, I, I feel if we might injure some people. If I get my two peas out of the picky rank and start launching, <laughs> I ain't got any paper to throw. It'll be coffers. No. So, what are you thinking? We're going to do a competition. Oh, let's discuss this off air. Okay. I like this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we should do that. We should do that. All right. Brilliant. Lovely to chat. We'll speak soon. Okay. Chat soon, Vicky. Take it easy. Thanks, everyone. Bye.